Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our third session of our uh, RSET webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Scenario-Based Eco-Forecasting. My name is Amber McCollum, and today we'll have a guest speaker, Brian Miller, from the USGS, as your instructor. First, again, I just have a few reminders. For this course, we will have four one-hour sessions each Thursday in September at 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have lectures followed by a short question and answer session. You can find all the course materials listed on the website in English and Spanish. If you have any additional questions after our session today, you can also email myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt and our email addresses are listed there below. We will have two homework assignments which will be submitted via Google Forms. The first homework link is available on the RSET website, and we've also posted it in the um, chat box on the panel in your browser. The second homework link will be available next week. The homework deadlines for the first homework, it's due on September 28th, so that's next week. And the second homework is due on October 12th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend three out of four live webinars and complete both homework assignments. Um, and you can expect to receive a certificate of completion about two months after the end of the course. So there's one prerequisite for this course, um, the fundamentals of remote sensing, and the website for that is listed here. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the website listed here. You'll find a PDF of the presentation in both English and Spanish, and you can also download those um, in your browser um, right now for this week. A link to view the recording will be available a few days after each session, and um, the links for the homework assignments are available there too. Just as a note, in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. So you have to input your information again, but then you'll be taken directly to view the recording online. And this just helps us keep track of who, who is viewing um, the recordings. So for this session, we're focused on providing an overview of scenario planning. Our guest speaker, Brian, will provide an introduction to scenario planning and how scenario planning can be useful in management decisions. He will discuss the phases and steps on how to create scenarios and review the implication, implications and management responses when applying scenarios. And then um, if there's time, we'll have a um, question and answer session. So now I'm going to hand it over to our guest speaker, Brian Miller from the USGS. So please just bear with us for a few moments while we transfer over to his screen. OK, thanks, Amber. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and listening in. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be a part of uh, this webinar series and, and talk with you all today. Um, so uh, I'm going to be building on uh, the last two sessions. Uh, I think last week, Helen, uh, gave us a really nice uh, overview and introduction to uh, climate data, uh, the various kinds, both historic uh, and projected, uh, as well as uh, their application, um, and, and really had some nice suggestions for, for how uh, best to use those climate data, um, you know, both in, ter in terms of interpreting the data themselves, um, some advice on sort of selecting models, um, and sort of giving you an idea of and sort of the range of um, model projections and uncertainty inherent in those projections. Um, and so today, I'd like to, to really um, focus on uh, this question of what do we do with in the face of, of that uncertainty? And what do we do about the uncertainty that we have uh, sort of in terms of uh, climate model projections, but, but also um, uncertainty in general in terms of uh, forecasting or projecting into the future? And I'm going to sort of talk about that question in, in light of one particular tool, as Amber mentioned, uh, and that is scenario planning. 
So I think the, maybe the best place um, to start uh, in terms of this topic of uncertainty and thinking of the future is to maybe come at it with a bit of humility um, and recognize that, generally speaking, we're, we're really not that great at predicting the future. Um, and for good reason, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge and something that uh, we continue to work on and strive toward. Um, and, and here, you know, I've kind of depicted a, a more popular culture kind of example um, of uh, from the movie Back to the Future, uh, where they travel forward in time uh, to the year 2015. Um, and, you know, they sort of depict 2015 as having a whole bunch of different technological advancements like, um, you know, hover cars and hoverboards and things like that. And, of course, um, you know, here in 2017, uh, that's not exactly uh, the reality. Um, and so that, that's just sort of a, a bit of a um, sort of funny or lighthearted example. Um, but uh, this applies to other sort of real world things as well. Um, another uh, example being with the advent of the television in the middle of the 20th century, um, you know, a lot of people thought, well, yeah, television, it's kind of this neat new invention. but um, really, it's not going to take off. Um, it's something that we just simply do not have time for. And of course, uh, that can be further from the truth. Um, but I think this applies too uh, to more sort of quantitative or academic or you know, more formal uh, assessments of, of the future and uh, what might happen. Uh, here I've got a quote um, relating to uh, economic predictions. And, you know, if you ask sort of uh, the average expert uh, in, in economics, um, they correctly predicted the direction of interest rates just 22% of the time. Um, and uh, that is considerably less than just predicting it with a coin toss. Um, and, and this is just the direction of interest rates, let alone the magnitude. And, and I don't mean to pick on uh, economists here. Uh, this is something I think that uh, can be found across a variety of disciplines. And there are abundant examples of our relatively poor track record. Um, with forecasting. Um, but, you know, should we be sort of paralyzed or I guess um, completely uh, derailed by this notion that we're, we're not good at predicting the future? Uh, of course not. Um, I don't think so. Um, in part because, you know, we can already observe changes that are happening uh, around us, either historically or currently. Um, in this figure here on the right, um, this is from a paper by Bill Monahan and Nick Fizzichelli, uh, where they analyzed temperature changes for national parks, uh, national park units around the United States, indicating that uh, indeed there is um, substantial uh, warming trends across the vast majority of parks and protected areas. So we know that there are changes that are occurring. Um, and based on our best available information, like the information that Helen was talking about last week, more changes are expected. And it, Coming along with these changes are some potentially dire consequences uh, for the resources, communities, and things that we care about. And so um, we have this information, but there's uncertainty associated with it, as we discovered last week. And so we're, we're kind of um, left with this situation where we know things are happening, uh, things are going to continue to change, we don't know exactly how, um, and so what should we do? Um, and, and so I would argue that maybe uh, instead of being completely daunted by this question, um, maybe we should just step back for a moment. And I would ask each of you to kind of think to yourself um, right now, you know, what do you do when you're faced with making a decision but are uncertain about the future? Um, this is something uh, I think that we do on a regular basis um, and, and often informal or in inconsequential or, or ways that are, don't have big consequences, but um, it's something that I think we're, we're quite used to doing uh, just as people. Uh, we kind of ask ourselves those what if questions. You know, in other words, we sort of use scenario planning in our day to day lives. Um, and, you know, we create informed plans that kind of account for uncertainty, um, uh, but we don't let it stop us. And so whether this is uh, something like when or if to buy or sell a house, um, or how you want to invest your money um, or your retirement savings, um, or you know what you should do in the face of uh, a tropical storm or hurricane or cyclone. You know you might have uh, a weather forecast um, from NOAA or somewhere else, 
that gives you some cone of uncertainty on that storm path. Um, and you've got to make a choice about whether you're going to stay home or maybe try to evacuate. So um, a whole broad array of decisions, including the daily ones. You know, should I bring an umbrella to work? Um, you know, these kinds of things, we kind of go through and play out different scenarios of what might or might not happen uh, depending on the decision that we make. And in essence, uh, this is scenario planning, but uh, scenario planning, as we'll see here shortly, uh, can be done in a more formal and sort of structured kind of a way. And before I kind of dig into what scenario planning really is and how we do it, I just wanted to point out um, that it's been used in a whole variety of contexts, um, both private sector, military, um, government, nonprofit, uh, with quite a lot of success. Um, Royal Dutch Shell um, really, I guess, uh, pioneered or popularized um, or really showed the power of scenario planning uh, in using it to uh, plan for the substantial variability in uh, oil markets. Uh, and sort of they were able to weather uh, some of those storms uh, through scenario planning uh, efforts. I think another kind of neat example uh, is from uh, UPS, uh, the shipping company. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a threat of an avian flu pandemic and that, that prompted UPS to assemble uh, managers from different areas of the company for several workshops. And they sat down and thought about how a potential disease outbreak might affect their ability to serve their customers, uh, to ship things uh, nationally, internationally. And, um, and their objective in those exercises was to rehearse responses to various scenarios. Um, and it turned out that that avian flu pandemic actually didn't really materialize, uh, which of course is a, is a good thing for all of us. Um, and you might think, well, then it's kind of wasted effort. But um, in April 2010, uh, you might recall there was a volcano in Iceland that uh, spewed tons of ash into the air, disrupted travel across Europe, and that forced UPS uh, in their hubs in, in Europe to shut down. And so they recognized that just as in some of their pandemic scenarios, uh, air travel would be impossible in certain areas. And so because they understood the consequences, they could kind of work backwards and adapt their flu contingency plans to this volcanic eruption. And so here's a situation where scenario planning uh, really helped them be prepared for uh, something that, again, they didn't necessarily predict, um, but uh, could sort of reapply those lessons uh, to, to this novel situation. Um, and as a result, they didn't disrupt their service to their customers. Uh, and in recent years, um, the National Park Service has been, in the United States, has been using scenario planning with success for their various parks and protected areas. I'll have an example from um, some of those parks here in the talk. So what are scenarios? Um, you can really think of them uh, as stories, and stories of way, about the way the world might turn out tomorrow. Um, and again, these are meant to be tools that can help us to recognize and adapt to, to the way our environment is changing. And really, they're, they're often simplified descriptions of how the future might, might develop. And they're generally based on uh, sort of a coherent and internally set, consistent set of assumptions about driving forces and key relationships. And, and I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by driving forces um, and how those play into to developing scenarios. And I wanted to distinguish scenarios from um, maybe a more traditional forecast approach that you might be more familiar with, say from uh, weather forecasting or something like that, um, where you, know, you would say, okay, here's the future we expect to happen uh, with some possibly some range of uncertainty. You know, it's supposed to be uh, cloudy tomorrow, uh, plus or minus a 10% chance. Whereas with scenario planning, you're really preparing for multiple uh, very different futures. Um, so it could be sunny, cloudy, raining, um, and uh, you're sort of using what you know about um, your uncertainty level uh, to, to make plans for each of those different scenarios. Now, I will mention, too, um, in sort of defining what scenarios are here, that they, in and of themselves, uh, are not plans. Um, they can certainly be used to inform plans, um, as, we'll, as we'll see here with some examples, um, but they're not plans in and of themselves. 
Now that being said, uh, scenarios, you know, the the sort of hypothetical or um, sort of thought exercises uh, for thinking about the way the world might turn out. And oftentimes the scenarios themselves don't come to pass in any, um, you know, exactly as we might anticipate, um, but they can indeed come true. And I think there's a, a an interesting anecdote from a scenario planning exercise that took place in the northeastern United States um, back in 2012. Um, and I wasn't involved in this, but some, some colleagues were. And um, they were sitting down with managers thinking through some different possible climate futures, one of them having sort of more um, storm, heavy storm events and things like that. And they were pushing the participants to really think about uh, some more um, challenging uh, more severe sort of futures that are more different from today. Uh, and so ultimately, the managers came up with a, what they saw as a fairly out there kind of scenario where there were sort of the equivalent of a, of a cyclone or hurricane hitting the northeastern United States um, and even flooding the subways in New York City, which uh, hadn't happened previously. Um, but they thought, so they thought this was quite uh, extreme or out there. And not... Um, more than a couple of weeks later, in October of 2012, uh, Superstorm Sandy hit the Northeast US and indeed flooded the subways in New York City. So this is an instance where that scenario did indeed come to pass. Uh, I would say that's probably the exception rather than the rule, um, but uh, it does happen. Um, and I think, you know, speaks to, to the fact that, you know, we, we do need to try to push our thinking a little bit and uh, think outside of the box because uh, sometimes um, the future is perhaps um, more different from today than, uh, than we might initially think. Okay, so I've talked about kind of what scenarios are and generically about um, how you can kind of use them. But now um, I'd like to dig in a little bit more carefully into how you can create scenarios um, for your own applications. And and I'm going to point you to a resource that is freely available online, and the citation uh, or reference, rather, is in the lower left corner there. Uh, it's um, a document by Erica Rowland and others, um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, have, I'll revisit this citation later uh, in the talk in case you miss it. Um, but I'll point you there because um, I'm going to kind of give you a Cliff Notes version of the process of scenario planning, um, but they and others have really laid out carefully uh, a couple of different phases and steps within each of those phases for how to create and apply uh, scenarios. So I'm going to talk about, as I said, a subset of those phases and steps. Um, sort of the first phase being the creation of scenarios themselves. The second phase actually applying them, uh, sort of using scenarios uh, for management planning and decision making. And then the specific steps um, within creating scenarios, I'll talk about identifying key drivers um, and then uh, exploring what you call scenario logics. And then in way of applying scenarios, we'll talk about evaluating the potential impacts and implications of the scenarios. And then also going one step further to identify potential strategies or action options. So the first step in creating scenarios, and this is something that uh, Helen mentioned last week and, and I, is certainly worth reiterating. Um, when it comes to using climate data or um, I'd say most any modeling exercises, um, is to think about you know, what are the critical forces that will affect uh, the resources or operations or whatever you happen to be interested in in the future. So in fact, you may even want to take one step backwards and say, well, what are the resources or operations or um, things that I'm concerned about that matter to me or to my management partners or my constituents? And once you've really answered that question, then you can say, all right, what are the key forces that affect those? And these critical forces don't have to be climate. A number of the examples I'm going to talk about um, here today and just in the next few slides are climate related. Um, but I did want to mention that uh, they certainly don't have to be uh, climate. So, but what are critical forces? What does that mean? Um, critical forces are generally um, things that can influence your resource that have both high impact and high uncertainty. So the high impact um, piece, you know, kind of makes sense. Um, 
you know, what are the things that were most influential for my variable or resource of interest. Um, but you also want to um, narrow that list down by thinking about those, those variables or forces or influences that also have high uncertainty. Because um, if you know or have really sort of good confidence in what the trajectory is of a certain variable, then it's not really as useful to apply scenario planning to that particular force. Um, you can say, well, we know that's you know that land use is going to change in this way. Um, and so, okay, well, uh, we don't need to really consider that a quote unquote critical force for the purposes of scenario planning. So again, you want critical forces to have both high impact and high uncertainty. So let me give you an example here. So one variable, and, and this is an example from a uh, scenario planning exercise um, for some barrier islands in the eastern United States um, along the coast there. Um, and one of the key variables for this island system uh, was sea level rise, uh, which makes sense, right? Um, you're talking about an island system that is uh, really heavily influenced by uh, tides and, and um, and, and waves and, and how and the sea level rise could affect also marsh habitat and things like that. So sea level rise, if we look at our sort of available information, just talking about this sort of very qualitatively, generically, um, there's a range of what's projected to happen with sea level rise from sort of low or moderate um, to very significant, you might say. For this workshop, the other key force that they identified as being important were storm events. Um, and again, we've got sort of a range of uncertainty with this um, in high impact variable from sort of, you know, storms maybe staying about as they are today, sort of the same strength, maybe even a little bit less frequent than we're seeing them now, uh, to more intense and more frequent. So quite a range uh, in terms of uh, the severity of storms moving forward into the future. Now, one commonly used approach then for uh, starting to actually flesh out scenario logics is to take two variables like these and, and cross them so that you end up with four different quadrants. Um, and I'm going to walk through each of these again as an example to give you an idea of how you can then start to uh, flesh out what these scenarios might look like. So starting in the lower left quadrant, uh, a situation where you might uh, expect sort of low uh, to moderate sea level rise and, and storms that are about as they are today maybe a little bit less frequent, you might expect that for this barrier island system, um, it would remain sort of a dynamic system, but there might be a bit more intense pressure than in the past, partly due to that, um, you know, slight increase in sea level rise. And, and that sea level rise could reduce the size of the island. Maybe it's gonna actually open up some additional habitat for estuaries. And, and this is a place where I just wanna point out that uh, it's good as you develop scenarios to Think about both winners and losers, um, or sort of challenges as well as opportunities. Oftentimes, people will have a tendency just to think about the negative consequences of a scenario, but um, you know, keep your eyes out for, for potential opportunities as well. So that would be, you know, maybe one again a very basic um, uh, example, but one of the four scenarios that we could look at here. If we turn to the upper left quadrant situation with, again, maybe low to moderate sea level rise, but more intense and more frequent storms. Um, this could lead to uh, some serious impacts on the dune system. Um, maybe we'd see similar impacts of sea level rise on the island size and estuary extent. Um, but here's where we might start to, to get some more infrastructure impacts. So turning to the lower right quadrant, um, here we've got a situation where you know, storm severity and frequency is perhaps as it is today, but much higher sea level rise. Here we're getting a situation where you might expect islands to really shrink in, in size, um, perhaps getting some saltwater intrusion into the groundwater table, things like that. And then in the upper right, finally, um, perhaps the most extreme or most severe uh, change scenario, um, you could actually envision a situation where the islands become fragmented, perhaps they even turn into a sandbar, um, and it's going to have big impacts for aquatic, terrestrial, and, sh and salt marshes. And, you know, again, this is kind of a, a very basic uh, sort of shorthand version of, of scenario development. And I've even started here to allude to some possible impacts on aquatic and terrestrial systems. Um, but really what you want to do in this first step is to just start to outline what are the general 
sort of changes in these critical forces and uh, a bit of what those impacts might look like. And you can really dig into the impacts in the next steps coming up here. Um, but one more step within this process of developing a scenario logics, which is actually kind of a fun portion of it, but also quite useful, is to give names to these different scenarios. And having these shorthand names um, has a couple of benefits. For one thing, uh, it just makes them more memorable for people. Um, you know, particularly in workshops where you're sitting around the table with a whole bunch of different folks, it gives you a nice shorthand name that you can refer to that's memorable, that people immediately know kind of what you're talking about. Um, and so I would uh, encourage you to, 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 to develop and, and name scenarios um, and use that because it'll carry forward uh, throughout your scenario planning process, uh, as we'll see here with some other examples. So I'd like to give um, sort of another example here, but with just a little bit more detail uh, in terms of, of creating scenarios. Um, because that previous example that I just gave you with sea level rise and storms, um, it, it was, again, fairly qualitative. Um, I wasn't putting any numbers on the amount of sea level rise or the amount of rain associated with any storm. It was very kind of uh, general. And that can be sufficient. In a lot of cases, that might suit your needs. Um, but for situations where you'd like to perhaps uh, feed in a bit more quantitative information, uh, there are ways to do that as well. So for instance, uh, this is a study um, that I was a part of for southwestern South Dakota, which is in the northern Great Plains here in the U.S. Um, we were talking with resource managers from uh, national parks and public land and tribal lands um, and we started off uh, by asking, you know, what are your resources that you're really concerned about? Um, and one of them was the, the composition and production of grasslands, um, because those grasslands supported um, livestock as well as uh, wildlife like bison. Um, and so we knew that, okay, well, if that's the resource that they care about, uh, what are the, the climate drivers uh, that really have the biggest impact on grassland composition and production. And turning into the literature, we found that two of those key variables were uh, spring precipitation, which is depicted here uh, on the y-axis um, as a change in the April to June precipitation. And then also um, the start of spring, or what you might call the start of spring, or really the, the change in the last spring freeze date. Um, and so these two variables um, have been found to be predictive of uh, grassland composition, production, um, and so we use those to really frame our climate scenarios. And I should say, uh, I'm giving you kind of a snapshot of this work. Uh, we also were sitting around the table with um, folks who cared about other types of resources like infrastructure and roadways, uh, as well as paleontological and archaeological resources. And of course, those resources are um, affected by different critical forces, like uh, heavy rainfall events, for instance. Um, and so in our selection of scenarios, climate scenarios, um, it was also informed by, by those resource concerns as well. So um, I just wanted to point that out as a little caveat here um, in terms of our selection of climate models. So if we, if we return here to this plot of precipitation and spring freeze date, um, you see I've got a, a variety of, of, of numbers up here. And what each of those numbers represents, if you'll recall from uh, Helen's presentation from last week, each of those numbers represent a combination of a global climate model projection and a representative concentration pathway, or what you might think of as an emissions scenario. And so essentially what this graphic is, is telling you is that all of these global climate model projections are uh, estimating that spring will come earlier, um, although the number of days earlier that it's expected to arrive at mid-century, or rather 2020 to 2050, um, has a range of anywhere from about, you know, one or two days uh, to almost two weeks. Uh, at the same time, there's quite a bit of uncertainty in the way of spring precipitation. So um, not only are we uncertain about the projected change in the magnitude uh, of precipitation, but also the direction. Some climate models are projecting uh, more spring precipitation, whereas others are projecting less. And so what we wanted to do then is to select four different climate models, climate model runs, 
that kind of captured the range of variation in these climate variables as well as the other variables um, that are of interest to, to folks that manage things like paleontological resources and infrastructure. So that's why in this situation you might say, well, these color boxes, which represent our, our selected scenarios, don't capture the full range of these two variables. And that's largely because we were also concerned about a couple of other variables that I'm, I'm just not showing you here. If you'd like more details on that selection, you can certainly turn to the, the reference that's uh, provided here. Uh, that publication is freely available online. But uh, we selected four climate model scenarios. And then our task was to really summarize those in ways that were relevant to the resource management partners that we were working with. Because we wanted to take these scenarios and bring them to participatory workshops where we sat around the table with people who manage bison, people who manage grasslands, and have them tell us what would the impacts of each of those scenarios be. So we summarized these data in a whole bunch of different ways. So on the left here, uh, that this sort of box and arrow type diagram just represents the bullet form uh, of summarizing scenario logics that I was kind of like what I was showing you previously with the sea level rise example, sort of shorthand bullet form. We also provided tables um, that were more quantitative, giving people actual numbers associated with each of those four different climate scenarios, which we dubbed rather hot, awfully dry, wet in bursts in the jungle. Again, kind of giving those shorthand names to folks as a memorable way to kind of uh, recall, hey, yeah, th this, you know, the jungle uh, scenario represents a hotter and wetter uh, future than we're used to today, for instance. So we summarized it in, in forms of tables, um, also tables that just really qualitatively depicted changes in terms of um, arrows uh, and, and the magnitude of changes as the size of the arrows. And then finally, uh, one thing that we found quite useful was to summarize the climate model uh, output in terms of uh, analogous years uh, that people might remember. So for instance, uh, 2012 was a drought year uh, in this part of the world. And so people really recall that as something that was memorable uh, for their management and their management units. And so we could say, well, you know, uh, if you look at some of the precipitation or temperature uh, projections, for one of our scenarios, maybe that's really quite similar to, to the drought year of 2012. And so under you know, the awfully dry scenario, let's say, the average year might be like uh, that drought year you had in 2012. And that's a nice way for people to kind of relate to these scenarios, um, at least that's what we found. So again, the point here being, it's useful to kind of summarize your climate data or whatever projections you might be working with in a variety of formats that people can ex find accessible and understandable and relatable. And I will say that, um, again, you know, you don't have to develop scenarios only um, by using climate data. Um, there's a variety of remote sensing data sources out there um, that you can use to kind of either contextualize the scenario planning process or help you think about possible future scenarios of change. Um, you know, for instance, you might uh, use LIDAR data um, to uh, look at um, the elevation of a given location and do some projections for sea level rise for that given location. Um, there's a lot of information out there on uh, demographics, human population uh, change, whether it's growth or uh, immigration or immigration. Um, uh, there are a lot of land use models out there. Um, so this all is to say that um, I would urge you to sort of think beyond climate data. Um, and there's a nice example uh, reference here from Vargas Moreno and Flaxman that um, really thinks about climate, but also land use change scenarios uh, for uh, their study area in Florida. And as you develop these scenarios, um, you know, there's a couple of sort of guiding principles that I would sort of urge you to kind of keep in mind uh, as, you, as you develop and select scenarios. So you want your scenarios to be plausible. Um, they should in some ways be just believable and realistic. You don't want to go too far out there. Um, the one thing that won't be very useful, um, but also, uh, you know, people won't find that very relatable. So the second characteristic of, you know, sort of good scenarios, so to speak, uh, is that they're challenging. They do want to be thought provoking and a bit provocative. So there's a balance here um, between plausibility and how challenging that they are. 
But of course, uh, they should always be relevant, uh, and, and that is uh, significant and uh, important to the resources or things that you or your partner, management partners, care about. And finally, you want them to be, be divergent. You want them to be uh, different from each other, or as different from each other as possible. So uh, if you'll recall back to a few slides ago where I was showing that plot of climate model out, but we were trying really to pick climate models that were in sort of different um, portions of the, the climate space. And again, you know, these scenarios, you want to think through um, sort of the good and the bad parts. Um, try and uh, insert characters into your storylines. And by characters, I mean, you know, this could be, um, you know, different species of wildlife or, um, uh, or vegetation um, or institutions. Um, and really think about who, who would benefit and um, who would sort of lose under each of these different scenarios. So don't just think about the negative consequences. Think about opportunities as well. So that gave you a flavor um, for, you know, what good scenarios look like and how to, how to create them. And now, um, to my mind, this is perhaps the more interesting part, is thinking about actually applying those scenarios um, to resource management questions and starting then to use scenarios for your own purposes. So as I've been sort of indicating all along, um, you know, you might do some of this legwork of developing scenarios ahead of time. Some people do that, that in a participatory way, but you might just do that at your own uh, sort of office and then get together with, um, uh, I would say, as diverse a group of stakeholders as you can. Um, and these could be folks, again, um, some examples from my experience, you know, you might have a, a bison management expert as well as a grassland management expert, somebody who is more uh, versed in infrastructure development or facilities and things like that really get a broad group of people together to think about what would the implications of each of those scenarios be? And then ultimately, how might they respond uh, to those, those changes? And so um, I'd like to talk about these two things a bit separately here. So both the effects, uh, the impacts, that is, and then also the management responses. So in terms of impacts um, of each of the scenarios, um, you you want to have that diverse group of people sort of sitting around uh, the table, often in breakout groups, sort of small groups tend to work well, um, and have them think through, you know, what would the effects of each of the different scenarios be for their resources of concern? Um, and I recommend doing this in mixed groups because um, oftentimes as you sit down and think about, okay, for this given climate for land use scenario, uh, there might be some indirect effects that might go unnoticed um, if you didn't have sort of people sitting around who are concerned about different things. So uh, for instance, if you've got a change in uh, growing season that might affect vegetation, um, perhaps changes in vegetation could um, sort of by extension affect erosion and thus uh, infrastructure. And those kinds of connections are things that you really want uh, to make sure and highlight uh, during the development of the scenario impacts. And again, having mixed groups of people um, helps to do that. And then the next step being actually thinking of management responses. Um, so, okay, if we've sat down and we've thought about the possible impacts under each of our possible different futures, um, how might we respond? And um, this is something that people will sometimes call wind tunneling, and I'll, I'll explain why that, that term is used here in just a second, or you'll see why. Um, but it's just a way of using the scenarios as kind of a way to rehearse for the future. And in doing so, you want to ask yourself a couple of questions. So for each scenario, um, you know, is your current management strategy well positioned to succeed if the world turns out like this scenario suggests it might? And what aspects of your strategy need to be kept in place in order to succeed? And what aspects of it need to change? And in what ways? And so to give you a, sort of a, a bit of an example to kind of illustrate what I mean exactly, um, and what I mean in particular by wind tunneling, you might think about your strategy or resource management strategy or, uh, as an airplane. And you know, before you took an airplane out um, and flew it in the real world, you might want to put it into a wind tunnel to see how it responds to different conditions. And people might do this with computer simulation or what have you. 
but the, the basic idea is the same, that um, you want to take out, take your, your tool, your strategy, and test it out. Um, see how it does. See if the plane crashes or if the wing rips off uh, under different conditions. And it's the same idea here with applying scenarios. So think of your, your airplane or your strategy as an airplane. So for instance, uh, you know, the maintenance of some historical fish species. Maybe that's your goal. You really want to, to maintain this in a given location. And you can think of the wind conditions as your different scenarios. So, you know, your first uh, scenario might be what you call, call like a least change scenario. Um, perhaps a situation where you might have a little bit of warming in temperature, but precipitation is about the same. And you might think, well, hey, if that happens to be the, the case, you know, I think that my strategy, current strategy would still be successful. And that's great. Then you think about another, another scenario, um, perhaps one that is hotter and maybe drier. Um, and you might say to yourself, yeah, well, you know, I think that my approach for maintaining this fish species by, let's say, stocking uh, this fish species in a, in a given stream or lake system, yeah, I think that, you know, they have the, uh, the physiological tolerance to, to be able to withstand those new conditions, and I think I'd still succeed. And, but then you might turn to a third scenario that's hot and wet. Um, perhaps you've got more severe storms or something like that that could cause more turbidity in the stream system. And as you walk through that scenario, you might say, well, yeah, this fish species is really sensitive to, to those, the variability in flows. And so that would be a situation where maybe the plane crashes, your strategy might fail. Um, and so you need to kind of go back to the drawing board and say, hey, what do we need to do um, in order to be successful? Under, under that scenario, if indeed it comes to pass. And as you revisit those strategies, it might be useful to deconstruct your strategy into goals and actions. Um, uh, these are kind of two different things that often kind of get lumped together, um, but in scenario planning it can be quite useful uh, to determine if uh, there need to be changes to either your goals or your actions or both. So if, you know, you are in a situation where um, perhaps uh, your current goals and actions might be tenable under a given scenario, that's what you might call a business as usual kind of approach. So again, turning to a, a fish example uh, for say a cold water fish species, um, that you want to maintain in a given location, that's your goal, and you're doing it by stocking fish into that particular location each year. That's your current goal and current action. It looks like it could be successful. That's great. That's sort of business as usual. Now, there are some scenarios where maybe you need to retrofit things. So your goal of maintaining this cold water fish species is, is achievable, you think, but in order to achieve that goal, you might need to change the way you're doing it. Maybe you need to stock more fish um, than you used to or at different times of year. Um, so that would be, again, what we call a retrofit. And in the third and perhaps more extreme case, you might have a situation where, you know, you really need to rethink both your goals and your actions. So perhaps there's a climate scenario where uh, the stream temperatures are just going to be too high uh, to sustain this fish species that you're interested in even no matter how much you stock the, the stream or in what times of year, uh, it's, more, it's most likely going to fail. And so perhaps that's a situation where you need to revisit your goals. Perhaps you need to think about different fish species that you want to maintain there. And this is often the most contentious um, sort of uh, situation where you need to think about uh, a rebuild, as we call it. Um, but, you know, it's better to rehearse that, that kind of a, a situation now um, and really to start to untangle uh, the difficulties, challenges, and, and opportunities in doing that kind of a rebuild rather than doing it sort of in a crisis response mode. And along those lines, you might want to add a time element to this process. So rather than thinking statically about some end time point, um, in, say 2050 or 2100, where uh, you might say, well, you know, I need to change the way that I'm doing things to achieve my goal at that you know, sort of future point in time. Think about how um, things could unfold over the coming years, both in terms of your scenario, so how might uh, sea level rise or climate or land use um, change through time, and also 
how might my management responses change through time as well? And, and are there particular <clears throat> uh, points where um, you might you know, say, hey, this is a critical sort of threshold or a trigger that I need to be aware of. So <clears throat> if, there, you know, if X happens, then I need to do Y. Um, and planning that out ahead of time, again, is really quite useful um, rather than just sort of moseying along and, and perhaps missing cues that you need to, to change the path that you're on. Um, or, you know, there's particular things that you need to do now to lay the groundwork uh, for more dramatic changes that you might have to take in the future. So if you anticipate that, hey, under a given climate scenario, I'm going to need to change the species that I'm uh, managing for, um, that might require some substantial changes in, say, your uh, enabling legislation um, or, you know, just the mentality of the partners that you work with. And so you might need to spend the next five to ten years just working on those sort of institutional barriers so that when it comes to it down the road and you really do need to make those more dramatic changes in your management goal or actions, you've already laid the groundwork going ahead. So, again, adding a time element uh, to the scenario planning uh, I think is quite useful. And this helps you to really rehearse for potentially difficult decisions that are coming down the pipe. So I wanted again to, to refer you to this uh, publication that's available online for not only additional details on the scenario planning process, but also they have a really nice set of about a dozen examples of scenario planning for natural resources um, in that document as well. And there's another sort of similar document from the National Park Service uh, that has similarly useful information that's, that's depicted here on the left. So what are the, the take home messages um, that I'd like you to walk away with. I think you can always go back, you can reference these slides or these uh, manuals uh, to really get at sort of the specifics of scenario planning. But um, the things I think to keep in your mind um, going forward and um, also for next week is uh, I think first and foremost, you know, um, I think we got to be a little bit humble and recognize that we're not always uh, the best at predicting the future, but we can create informed plans that account for uncertainty. Uh, we don't have to either ignore uncertainty or just give up. We can still do something about it. And scenario planning um, has proven useful for doing just that. And it's, it's been used in a whole variety of contexts. And sort of a teaser for next week, um, you know, today I've been talking largely about sort of qualitative scenario planning or scenario planning perhaps with some quantitative information. Um, we're really mostly using uh, sort of workshops and participatory workshops um, to think through scenario impacts and responses, um, which again, um, not to downplay that, that is in and of itself quite powerful. But we're now starting to explore this idea of uh, how we might use the quantitative tools that we have available to us to improve um, you know, the specificity of our scenario planning and, and also uncover surprises, things that we might not anticipate. Um, by just doing thought exercises. You know, the computational power uh, of some of our quantitative tools, I think, can uh, really be an asset uh, in scenario planning. And that's something that we'll get to explore next week. So stay tuned for that. So with that, um, I will say thank you. And uh, I'll look forward to, to talking with you again next week. Um, I'll take some questions here as well. But um, uh, just a, an ad for next week, Catherine Jarnovich and I will be giving a talk on um, simulation modeling and species distribution modeling. So with that, um, I think we're going to have some question and answer session and I'll pass the screen over so that you can, can have a look at those. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. And while we're transferring on over to the um, question and answer document, I just wanted to let you all know if you want to um, interact with each other and provide your contact information, you can do so also in the um, question box and we'll be sure to share those with you so you can see them as well. And um, yeah, Brian will just go through some of these questions for a few minutes um, and answer what he can. So thanks again and um, we'll look forward to seeing you next, next week as well. So. Great. Thanks, Amber. Um, so yeah, looking at the questions coming in here, uh, yeah, we can start here with question number one, which is 
uh, economists have mountains of data compared to the environmental data we work with, and yet economic forecasts are worse than a coin toss? Uh, a good question, um, and let me clear, use that as an opportunity kind of to clarify uh, the meaning of that particular slide there. Um, so that particular slide was, was talking about um, the prediction of interest rates um, in particular. So uh, I did not uh, intend to lump together all economic projections as being sort of less useful than a coin toss, um, but rather this is a particular anecdote um, on, you know, sort of expert predictions of interest rates, and I believe that that was um, you know, sort of using their expert knowledge to make that prediction. So uh, again, don't want to uh, suggest that uh, economic projections are particularly bad or something like that. Rather, uh, just an anecdote to illustrate that um, forecasting is indeed a challenge and various disciplines, you know, environmental sciences included, uh, have a spotty track record with doing just that. So let's see, question two here. Um, how if the critical forces uh, of the scenario is more than two? How we combine it in scenario planning? So um, one way of doing that, and that's a good question, because that's frequently the case, that you have perhaps more than two important variables. Um, one approach for, for addressing that issue is um, if you went back and looked at, I believe it was slide number 21 and 22, where I have um, sort of the two axes, the, the sea level rise and the storm uh, example, where I've sort of crossed those two axes to create four different quadrants. One thing that you can do is to then um, nest scenarios. So within each of those quadrants, you could then um, take two other variables and create um, sort of four more quadrants nested within each of the, the original ones. So perhaps, um, you know, uh, it storms and sea level rise, but you're also concerned about temperature change and land use change. And so, you know, your main axes might be storms and sea level rise, and then within each of your quadrants, you might uh, look at sub-scenarios of land use change and, and warming temperatures or something like that. So again, you can do sort of nested scenarios within each of, of the quadrants. So that's one approach. So question number three here, what are the do nots for scenario planning to consider? Um, so I think the, the, a couple of things. Um, you know, first off, um, don't assume necessarily that uh, scientists are the best ones to run and facilitate scenario planning workshops. Uh, I've discovered that it's really quite uh, important to have good facilitators. That's something that I didn't mention. Um, I think it's tempting to say, hey, yeah, I kind of understand how scenario planning works and um, I could get some people together and do it. Um, and that may be true, um, but oftentimes having a good facilitator can really be a make or break uh, for a, a good scenario planning and effective scenario planning workshop, um, particularly if you're discussing any issues that are contentious um, or you know, you've got a situation perhaps where there's one person or a few people really dominating the conversation um, that could really derail a scenario planning process. And you want uh, somebody in the room to facilitate who, who can help to address those, those issues. Um, let me think here. So uh, other things that you might uh, consider. Um, you know, I, I don't, and I alluded to this here at the end of the talk, um, don't assume that um, the scenario planning process will necessarily give you an answer um, in a couple of ways, I guess two ways. Um, one, I think that there are limits to our ability to kind of flesh out scenario impacts and responses by just using our own uh, sort of cognitive capacity. That's where computer tools that we'll talk about next week can come into play and really help to bolster the scenario planning process. And also, um, the second being that you don't, I, I wouldn't expect to necessarily walk out of a scenario planning exercise with an answer, a single answer anyway, about the best plan of action to, to move forward on. Um, scenarios are complex. And more than likely, you'll find that, um, you know, there are really difficult and nuanced conversations that have to continue beyond the scenario planning process. 
um, and you won't walk out with a single, hey, this is what we should do kind of an answer. Oftentimes there's hard decisions um, that you'll need to address sort of uh, collectively coming out of it. So um, again, it, it won't necessarily uh, give you a, a hard and fast answer. Let's see. So question four, I'll likely answer probably via email. Um, I can go back and sort of dig through and, and find some non-US examples um, and, and share those with the group. What are key factors that are unpredictable uh, the most in scenario planning? Um, this varies a lot by location and the resource that you're concerned about. Um, so again, because scenario planning uh, is really applicable to a wide variety of sectors, um, whether that's in, uh, you know, like Shell Oil, Royal Dutch Shell using uh, scenario planning to, to sort of cope with variability in oil markets or UPS planning shipping routes or the National Park Service um, doing bison management. Each of those different situations has very different um, key factors um, or critical forces that are important to them. Um, you know, of course, in, in my world, uh, thinking about climate change, particularly here in the north central United States, um, a common one is, is precipitation. Uh, we have pretty uh, consistent projections in terms of warming, but uh, changes in precipitation are, are quite uncertain, both in terms of the magnitude and, and direction of change. Um, but again, uh, the key factors vary quite a lot depending on what you're concerned about. Um, yeah, I guess just thinking quickly here, uh, another common one I think is population projections. Those are another one that's commonly used, whether it's in terms of economic forecasting, land use forecasting, uh, resource management planning. Uh, that has a lot of effects on, on different resources. Could you give me an example about the flood scenarios? Question number six. Um, I suspect maybe you're, you're talking about um, uh, um, perhaps the example I was giving from South Dakota with the heavy rainfall events. I'm not sure, but um, we can run with that. Um, in that situation, um, it's a very erosive landscape, and um, there are a lot of fossils um, and archaeological resources uh, there that are exposed when there are heavy rainfall events. And so for that, um, for those resources, we were really looking at um, divergent futures for variables like um, you know, heavy rain events, um, rain events that were over a threshold, I think, of a couple of inches of rain. Um, so those heavy rain events would be the ones that would be impactful for exposing fossils and things like that that um, could either be washed away or looted and things like that. And similarly, you know, you could imagine um, uh, other flooding, con areas with other flood concerns might be interested in the, the duration of flooding events. You might want to look at uh, floods of a certain duration, like three-day rain events, um, or you might have a particular threshold in terms of amount. Um, so question seven, is there any chance that any of the recent current major hurricanes were foreseen in any previous scenario plan? Um, a good question. You know, I think that, uh, you know, that example I gave you of Hurricane Sandy uh, in the northeastern U.S. Uh, was one where that group just happened to kind of predict that sort of a storm event uh, occurring. Um, you know, I think that's probably the exception rather than the rule. Uh, you know, scenario planning has that ability. You know, every once in a while you might get lucky and predict a specific sort of kind of event or impact. Well, more likely than not, I'm guessing that, um, you know, maybe people didn't expect or, or you know, um, predict the specific impacts um, of a given storm um, for, a, for a particular area. It's possible, but um, I'm afraid that uh, I, I'm not aware of anyone that has predicted that in a scenario planning workshop. Let's see, I'm looking at question eight here. So in your opinion, what is the most difficult to effectively communicate between scientists from different fields, politicians, um, and community on scenario planning, and what solution uh, could be to deal with it? Um, 
guess let me start with by saying that I think the ben in some ways the benefit of scenario planning is that it's intuitive for people. And I think people find it accessible and it makes sense, especially when you frame it in terms of just the daily decisions that we are all making uh, and our ability to kind of cope with uncertainty. So in that sense, I think it's a, it's an, a really powerful tool for connecting diverse groups of people because it's relatable to a lot of different people. Um, now within a scenario planning context, um, it can be difficult to communicate um, changes in your critical forces to, across disciplines or different types of people. Uh, thinking of climate as an example, uh, you know, climate change in, is politically contentious. And so uh, if you are in a scenario planning exercise with people um, who, you know, may not uh, believe in climate change, uh, it can be challenging to kind of get past that initial conversation about, um, hey, you know, climate is changing and, and this is, and it's expected to change further. And so um, you have to sometimes be careful with the way that you present your scenario so as not to alienate anyone. You still want everyone to be at the table for the scenario planning work. Um, and there are, I think, good ways to do that. You can talk about climate change without talking about climate change per se. Um, you know, and also you, you can note that, look, this is sort of the best available information that we have about what might happen with particular climate variables. So rather than talking about climate change writ large, you can say, hey, uh, our best available science projects these changes in, you know, spring precipitation or temperatures. And, um, you know, does that sort of match with what you've already seen? Uh, you know, talking to people and trying to relate to them on, on a personal level, I think really helps overcome some of those hurdles and gets people invested in the process. And I think by keeping people in the fold, keeping people engaged, I think they'll walk away from scenario planning workshops um, feeling more open-minded about using the science that we do have available to plan for the future. Um, I think particularly if you come at it with some humility and saying, look, we can't predict the future. Uh, nobody can. Uh, but this is our best our best attempt to do so. Uh, I think people can really identify with that. And I'll only add here at the end, um, this is another situation where great facilitators are really important um, to help facilitate that communication um, between scientists and management partners and people sitting in the room. Um, that's That's another benefit of a good facilitator. So question nine here, do you have any example of scenario planning for agricultural lands, like croplands or rangelands? Um, yeah, and in fact, two of the examples I mentioned in the talk, um, the, one of them being from South Dakota, um, that did encompass rangelands uh, where uh, people were grazing cattle, um, uh, as well as you know parks and protected areas. That was a good example where we had kind of a mix of different jurisdictions that included rangelands. It did not include, include croplands. Um, I believe some of the land use planning scenario work that was done for Florida, um, the example that is listed in the Roland et al. Um, uh, report, uh, they have a nice uh, example of land use change that also includes agricultural lands, um, so, so I would look there. But those are sort of the two that jump to mind. Um, are there any data sets of global land use and land cover projections uh, that one can use as regional climate model input? Um, yeah, um, I guess I'm, it seems like maybe we have kind of, might be two questions kind of in, in one here. Um, so yes, there are um, land use and land cover change projections. Um, some of them are national in scale um, and and some are more localized. Um, and these can be, again, quite useful for scenario planning efforts. Um, the question about can you use them in climate model, in regional climate model input, um, I'm perhaps not the best person to answer that question. Um, there are um, uh, Earth system models that, of course, use uh, changes in, in land cover that affect the climate system. Um, but I can't speak to um, you know, particular examples of, of using those data in combination 
All right, on slide 27, it says that scenarios should be thought-provoking. Does this mean that in order to create more awareness, uh, let's see, sorry, I lost the slide there for a second, one moment, let me get it back up. Here we go. Um, uh, uh, yes, does that mean that in order to create more awareness, only the pessimistic scenarios should be used? How to balance and transmit the outcomes from a range of scenarios, positive to negative, and still create sufficient awareness and interest from local, regional, national governments. Yeah, um, so the, the message um, on slide 27 um, about being uh, thought-provoking. Um, so I meant that in the sense that they don't necessarily have to be pessimistic, um, but rather um, perhaps provocative or um, challenging. Uh, in, in the sense that, um, you know, you, you don't want to sort of stick to things just as you know them today, um, because that won't really sort of push your thinking on the possible consequences of future changes and responses. Um, you really want to um, go a step further to uh, consider scenarios that perhaps are a bit outside of your comfort zone. They don't necessarily have to be pessimistic. I think whether or not they're pessimistic or pessimistic or optimistic depends on the resource you're concerned about or the different sort of characters or players within a scenario. So I think within any scenario, um, you know, there's going to be winners and losers. Um, and so I think any scenario in and of itself isn't necessarily pessimistic. Some are, of course, uh, represent more dramatic changes uh, from our current or historic conditions than others. Um, but whether or not those changes are good or bad um, depends a lot on um, you know, what, who or what you're talking about. Um, so I hope that clarifies uh, the, uh, that portion of the talk. All right, well, I think um, that is uh, all the questions that we have for now. Um, and uh, yeah, I believe that uh, you're also able to send in questions later, but I'll defer to Amber uh, on that. And uh, I'll look forward to speaking with you all next week. So thanks very much. Great. Thanks again, Brian, for that really uh, fantastic presentation. And thanks to you all for um, providing those questions. And we eventually will get the transcripts of the, the question and answer sessions up online. We have the um, previous weeks one and two available for you all. And so um, stay tuned for that. And then again, we look forward to um, having you all for our final week um, next week where um, we will again have um, our guest speakers and they will uh, be talking a little bit more about um, species distribution and state and transition simulation modeling. So thanks again all and uh, we look forward to next week. <laughs>